Good morning, everyone. I want to thank everyone for their patience. Uh, definitely worth the wait. Uh, my name is Eric Wall. I am the director of the Lender Institute for American Art. I want to take this opportunity to thank all of you for participating today and to welcome those of you who are joining us again after uh, being here with us yesterday for the amazing panel and reception that we had. And for those of you that are just joining us today, welcome. Um, the Lender Institute, established in 2017, was created as a space to explore the intersection between art making, research, and scholarship. And I would say that there is no better example or testament to this work than painted our, our bodies, hearts, and village. Uh, this work started very early on, and I am so honored to be a part of it and to be a steward of that work. It is about cultivating, preserving, archiving, and growing this work. If you weren't able to join us last evening, let me share with you what stood out most to me during the panel discussion and the receptions. Community and connection. That is what I heard, that is what I heard most what, that emerged from conversations both during our panel and during the reception. We are here today to be in conversation, but more importantly, to be in community. Community is about relationships, and the Lender Institute has provided us opportunities, many of whom are here, to be fellows. And to be a fellow is to be in relationship with the Lender Institute, this museum, and this institution, and the community in which it sits and lives. What we're doing here today is building community around the work that we do, sharing, learning, and looking to the future and the possibilities of doing more. The idea of community is about looking at those who have come before us and helped us to establish what we have here today. We must, we must always reference their work. In talking with Teresa Secord, a member of our Board of Governors, she said to me how often people ask her why she references other artists during her artist talk, because the work is done in community. And in that spirit, I would like to thank our Board of Governors. I'd like to acknowledge the Museum Board of Governors and their leadership of the Colby College for committing of Colby College for committing in 2016 to making the Colby Museum more diverse and inclusive and consistently endorsing and supporting actions that have helped us advance this goal from board and staff recruitment to acquisitions to programs. It's a living agreement to continually doing better. Those that gather here today and those of us that have the honor of being part of this program benefit from the work of those in the community, specifically the Pueblo community, for bringing us to this point. And so I want to also recognize that with us, we have two former Pueblo governors, Dr. Joseph Suina of Cochiti Pueblo and Brian Vallo of Acoma Pueblo. Thank you for being here. I'd like to also thank our funders, contributors, and supporters who make this work possible. I don't want to thank all of you for being participants in our event today. Dwayne Toma pointed out for us last night that we are all connected. And Virgil Ortiz shared with us that he realized at the ripe age of 16 that he and his work were part of something much bigger, like one bead in an immense work yet to be finished in a union of many thousands and millions and perhaps infinity of beads. And it made me think that our work is never done and that the opportunity we have is a gift that we explore today. I myself walked away thinking about two things yesterday. One was, I decided that I'm going to go through the exhibition, starting with the Futurism Gallery first, instead. When I walk through the painted exhibition, it'll help me to remember and to be inspired that we can start with the endless possibilities that the future holds for us, and that we should always be looking toward what we are able to build and grow in connection. And lastly, I'm truly awed by the individuals who created this exhibition. And what stood out to me most was when Juan Lucero said, and I quote, I don't make ceramics unless I have to. And I thought to myself, I don't make ceramics because I can't. Now, 
that may mean that a ceramics course is in my future, but what we have to really remember is that we need to celebrate and recognize the brain trust that we have here with us today. So on that note, I will welcome the aforementioned scholar, Lunder Institute fellow, and when needed, artist, Juan Lucero. Good morning. I never said anything like that. <laughs> Just kidding. It's recorded, so I can't say that. Uh, so this morning, I, I get the honor of introducing a couple of gentlemen that I really look up to and really admire in our communities back home. Um, first, I'd like to invite Mr. Uh, Dr. Joseph Sweena to the podium if you'd like to give a uh, prayer to begin our day. Um, Thank you, Juan. Good morning, everybody. I am Tsira Ima Rutsunahanish from the Pueblo of Kochiti, and it's an honor and a privilege for me to be here with you this morning. And so in our Pueblo communities, we always start a gathering that's of significance, and certainly this one is of significance because it is about telling stories, joining together, connecting. Uh, among various cultures, communities, different ethnic groups and economic groups and so forth. And so that is a very significant gathering uh, when we can get together and share stories and stories perhaps we've never heard uh, from a perspective of a, of a Pueblo. We have 19 Pueblos in New Mexico uh, and the Hopi villages, 12 or so in, in Arizona. And we actually have one in Texas, El Paso. So, you know, uh, quite a few Pueblos still uh, today. And we consider ourselves sovereign communities, nations. And so each year, uh, of course, we have transition that occurs in our communities and sometimes those transitions don't happen for three years as Governor Bryan here realized during the COVID years when he had to serve. So it is this, at this time of the year, you know, when the harvest is in from the fields and people are now out harvesting the wildlife, the deer, the elk, and other plants and animals to sustain their communities over, over the winter. So we are at a point in time now when uh, things are starting to come together as a harvest. And so no better season than to have a time of sharing of artists coming together. Lots of work they put into that. People who put displays on, administrators of various sorts that had to come together so in sharing what is here, it is like the time of harvest for us to reap and to enjoy and to learn. And so my prayer, my opening prayer is about just that, that our hearts, our minds will be open and those who speak, that they can do so without anxiety. Just enjoy talking about the work and things they have to share. Those of us who will listen will listen with our hearts and our minds open that in the end we take away something from here that we can use in life, that we can communicate with each other in spite of our differences. We have more things in common than we have differences after all. We are all connected, as has been said time and time again. So with that, I will go ahead and open with a prayer. Uh, in my Karis language, we have, by the way, we have six different languages uh, among the various pueblos that I, I mentioned, the 19 in New Mexico, the one in Texas, and then the Hopi villages uh, as one. So we have the Tewa, 
represented by Michael. And we have the Toa. I don't think we have anyone from Amos here. And then the Karis, uh, Governor Brian and uh, Vio and I both uh, come from Karis speaking Pueblos. And then we've got the Tiwa uh, right here. <laughs> 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 you, you can't hide. <laughs> And then we also have the Zuni and then the Hopi. <laughs> so we have quite a few languages and varieties and variations and dialects within those communities as well. You know, we've been apart for a thousand years in our own little villages. So slight changes here and there, but yet lots of similarities among the Pueblos still today. So with that, I'll go ahead and start the prayer. Cornmeal is what we use. And join me in your own way. Um, to center yourself however you do that with a prayer or with meditation of some sort so that we can come together and enjoy this day and learn from each other and teach each other as well. <coughs> cornmeal is an offering. With breath on the cornmeal, I will go ahead and ask the spirits to bless this day for all of us to join us as we are never alone. Each of one of us in the Pueblo, from the Pueblo perspective is a spirit. We have our own spirit within us as well. So with that, how Hemme et se shahi wat sarsti kekut. Cheat the cook ashkan, utsunia good me sati hate, it's a cheat the ara, a sinu ash kuamani, hemme shakeku, pirikan, sunia good me go wem a keku. Yuks oil set, yan hemme keku, no in the titiku, so truste, utusit sevetan. Good to see keku, do a titi, no good nit, no good nit, no hard nit, no genius, no good nutsis tikeku, umma, and a chupish. You try your medius, kushuma car, ishi or keku. Good realms to get Gahati Chat skewita and the same article could not much over it and you could not you. Joy is on your part to go up with the go good as you care could toss a sahaya on the umshke could do not is on at the attendish go hack as a safe good as you dare to get ya. Sarashka, so much of the penalty as it ask and is eating the sick joke on it then. How we cheat the pastry cheat that you drew our drug or our sage pastry could not take. Thank you. Have a good day. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Sweena. I didn't want to say too much before we I got our before we were able to say our prayer, but Dr. Sweena has been an advisor for me on a couple of projects now and I really admire what he does within his own community he works he's been working for a really long time in his community to uplift the language and really teach the youth and encourage the youth to um, continue their language practices and he's been an educator for many years at the University of New Mexico as well he's been governor he's been believe it or not Pueblo still have war chiefs and he's been a war chief many times and all the work that he's done has is really inspiring to me and I really look up to people like um, Dr. Sweena and I'm really I feel really privileged to be able to have a relationship with him and he's really supporting in everything that he has shared with me and I, I shared with you last night that he advised me to cover up a couple paintings in one of our galleries at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. And I wouldn't have thought of that without him, and I wouldn't have done that without him, and it was very impactful in the community. I think one of the most 
it was one of the most empower, mo mo one of the most powerful displays that we've had in those galleries in a very long time, just because it did invoke a lot of emotion in the community. Um, we talked about this on our drive back to our room last night. There was people that really understood and really felt what we were saying about knowledge in our Pueblo communities and knowledge within our, our how it has to be earned or only certain groups are allowed knowledge of the sacred knowledges. So it's really it was really funny to me to walk through the galleries and see some people being really upset that they just did not understand why they weren't allowed to see these images. Um, I think one of the one of my greatest accomplishments or one of our greatest accomplishments on that exhibition was actually a lady standing in front of the paintings, reading the label, looking at the paintings and saying, I understand exactly what that label is saying, but why am I not allowed to see these paintings? <laughs> <laughs> Very emotional about it. And I thought, then you don't get the label. You don't understand what Dr. Sweena is saying in the label about our knowledge. So I just want to say thank you, Dr. Sweena, for being here. It's, it, it's such an honor to have you here, and I'm really glad you came to Maine. Just so everybody knows, this is the last state in the country that Dr. Sweena had to check off on his list of <laughs> visiting. <laughs> and next, I want to uh, introduce somebody else that I greatly admire. Um, I'll, I'll read a small little bio here that we have on the website for the symposium. Brian Vile served as governor of Acoma Pueblo in 2019-2021. I feel like he's served many more times than that because he's been working for his people for a very long time. So I think his servitude to his people has been much longer than just that. So he's the former director of the Indian Arts and Research Center. Um, and was the founding director of the Sky City Cultural Center and Ha'aku Museum. He has spent more than 30 years working in museum development, repatriation of ancestors and cultural patrimony, cultural preservation, the arts, and tourism. And I met Brian probably, when was that, 2005, 2006, around there, when he was the museum director at the Indian Public Cultural Center. Um, I think his time there with us was maybe two years or so. And then he went on to start the Sky City Cultural Center and Museum in Acoma. But the work that has really impacted me and has, I, has really changed my mind on a lot of different things is his repatriation efforts of our ancestors back to our communities. And watching him go through the process, especially with, there's a re big repatriation happening now in Minneapolis at the Wiseman Museum of Art and understanding that process a little bit more and seeing what him and some of the other community members from the Southwest are doing and a lot of the impact they take for our people and visiting our ancestors is, is, not, is not an easy thing. Um, the emotional response, I know the trauma that they probably feel when they visit the collections at uh, these various museums is something that's probably not talked about and probably I, 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 I want to say thank you for doing that because it, it has to take a very strong person to be able to go in and visit with their ancestors and be able to bring them home and sustain the brunt of that impact to our communities and I, I truly appreciate the work that you do. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, Brian Vile. He's always governor, so I say Governor Brian Vile all the time. Go <laughs> <laughs> Hopa. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> and thank you, um, Juan, for the introduction. I'm really happy to be here. I, I've never been this far north um, in this state. Um, and on the conversation over here with Dr. Suina, uh, he mentioned that this was the last state that he, he's officially been across the country, uh, visited every state. And I told him I have four more to go. <laughs> <clears throat> but. Um, uh, 
and I still take the Amum at the Watranit school name, Patrick Mohem Axi. Iani Ashutzi, Sinautensi, not to Yan in Shanish dist. So thank you, Dr. Sweeney, for the beautiful prayer this morning and for grounding us. Um, I also um, had the privilege of offering my morning prayer um, and in this space, in this place, which is closest to what we in Akama call Hania um, Atsia which is the Atlantic Ocean. And so it was really um, beautiful to be out in, in the early this morning and take in the air and all of the gifts of the Creator and uh, in this this place far from home. Uh, I want to say also that Dr. Sweena and I go way back. <laughs> uh, he was my third grade teacher <laughs> um, at um, the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs School uh, located on the Akama Reservation. And uh, he became very good friends with my parents and I, we, we value his friendship and his leadership and always his willingness to offer good words of advice and, and guidance. So it was such a pleasure to be with him to, here today. <clears throat> and I'm also honored to be here with other Pueblo people and other Native people. Um, it's very rare that um, we come together in these spaces uh, or have the opportunity to come together in these spaces. And I'm going to be talking a little more about that uh, later in my presentation. So I want to also thank the Colby College uh, Museum and the Lunder Institute for American Arts and all the Native American collaborators for this opportunity to join you for this important symposium. I want to also extend, again, a special thanks to Mr. Juan Lucero um, for who reached out to me and uh, shared um, a little bit about this initiative uh, while I was uh, tending to other business at the Wiseman Museum in, in uh, Minneapolis. So thank you, Juan. When I was invited to um, offer a, um, uh, a presentation here, I, I was told um, that I could speak about any subject that I felt would you know, complement the exhibit, uh, and it's the native-influenced narrative. Um, and after learning more about the exhibit and its development, I was excited about the fact that this exhibit is yet another great example of how you know, meaningful collaboration with source communities and our Native American people can inform and educate and influence change in museum practice and in the academy. So today I will, or this morning, I will share some information about those significant experiences in my early uh, life that influenced my own interests in, in this work and um, work mainly in cultural resources management and, and work within the museum realm. Uh, but this is not a story about Shrag Eshtua, which is my Akama name and what my community or knows me as. Um, but it's, you know, rather a... Uh, I hope a, a um, story of the collective work of Native people that um, is really influencing some change and is uh, generating uh, interest and response from the museum community um, as a result of you know, this collaboration. These, this type of intentional engagement um, with Native people uh, is so important uh, because it, it does influence and, and it does not reform museum practice. It influences policy at all levels uh, and it activates uh, restorative justice um, and, ho and brings tribal sovereignty to the forefront. So anytime I give a, a, a presentation, I always you know, want to acknowledge uh, my ancestors and the places that they, they settled before arriving 
at our respective uh, Pueblo communities. And Kashkatch and Washbashaka, or Mesa Verde and Chaco Canyon, are two of these significant places that are quite important to Pueblo people. Um, and I, I am a member of the Sun Clan at Acoma, and um, when it was still possible, uh, I was fortunate to participate in pilgrimage uh, from my Pueblo to Chaco, uh, sacred areas in Chaco that were, um, was a four day on foot uh, pilgrimage. In this time, we're not able to do that uh, because of land status issues. Um, but we return um, when we can and um, on, on cycles. Uh, and, and I'm hopeful that um, you know, the work that we're doing together to preserve and protect sacred sites will allow us and, and future generations of our Pueblo people to continue visiting these places um, for offering and uh, for blessings. This is where I am from. This is Acoma Pueblo. Um, it sits atop this sandstone mesa, about 400 feet above the valley floor. And even today, uh, we do not have electricity or running water. And it's our choice to live this way, this simple life that um, has sustained our people and our culture um, for centuries. And it is this place where I grew up. It is a place that is I have a strong connection to and a place that has informed um, me as an Akama man and an Akama person of my responsibilities um, to uphold our culture, our language, our way of life, among other things. And um, I live in Santa Fe, uh, New Mexico, but I find myself returning to Acoma quite often. I'm also a cultural leader. I've been a cultural leader since the age of 11. So um, it's always a privilege to hop onto I-25 and Interstate 40 and arrive at this incredible place. So I want to just share briefly um, a significant uh, time in my life that uh, really influenced my uh, interests in the uh, work in this field of cultural resources management and, and museums. Um, I was a student at uh, New Mexico State University studying business and marketing um, when I was called back home, as um, former Governor Suina indicated, we. Uh, at the end of the year, um, learn of our newly appointed leadership. And in, in uh, 1991, I was appointed to serve as a tribal official for my community. And um, so and I, I happened to be home for winter break and got the news and didn't know what to do um, or how to respond to that news. Um, but it was the elders of my clan group who uh, came together and told me, well, you have to leave school and uh, it's only going to be one year and you have to come and fulfill this responsibility. And so there was a family gathering that, uh, um, uh, that day, later that day, and I, I, I arrived at my mother's house and there were many cars parked outside the house and I walked in and all of my clan relatives were present uh, to offer support and um, words of encouragement. And I, when I arrived, I walked in uh, with this idea that I would tell my clan uncles and my family that I couldn't do this because I didn't, I didn't know how to be a tri tribal leader. And I thought I was too young um, and that my involvement might not be um, you know, uh, appropriate at that time. And um, when I saw everyone in the, ho in the house, um, of course my thinking immediately shifted and um, without much, many words being spoken, my eldest of my clan uncles told me, 
you see all, he's, Till said this to me in, in, in our language, you see all of these people in this room, you have to go and accept this and do this for all of them and everyone in the community. And so I did, and um, um, eventually, or, or it turned out that I would serve three consecutive years as uh, the lieutenant governor for my tribe. And it was during this time that the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act was uh, signed into law by Congress. And the governor at the time um, uh, asked me to study the law, work with our tribal attorneys to make sense of this new policy, and determine to what extent our tribe would be engaged in, in the um, the mandates associated with this policy. It was also a time that our tribe, um, who had been in the tourism, uh, cultural tourism industry for, uh, well, since the early 1900s, uh, had expanded its uh, our tribal museum. And um, the governor also asked me to uh, be more engaged with that particular operation. So I found myself doing a lot of work in this area um, and did a lot of research to understand the history of museology and uh, understand some of the collections uh, in, in some of the larger institutions in this country, including the Smithsonian and the National Museum of the American Indian. And um, it was during this time also that I had the opportunity to uh, visit NMAI in New York and the collections um, and to try and understand uh, the, the uh, inventories that we received from the Smithsonian and uh, actually going to New York, into the Bronx, to the collection space to see the items. Now, that particular list that arrived at Acoma included almost 130,000 items. Uh, so it was impossible to think that I would see 130,000 items, but there were certainly some significant pieces that um, were imp of importance to us. And when we walked through the doors uh, in the area where they had a display, the f one of the first things I saw was a ceremonial item that was on display. And it shocked me. It scared me. It shook me in a way that I, I felt like I needed to walk right out of that space. Uh, and I wasn't traveling alone. I was with um, cultural leaders. But what, what, what was most disturbing was going into the collection space um, without any real welcome from the people who were working at this museum. Um, they, didn't, they weren't interested to know about us. They just wanted to go through the process and get us back out the door, basically. And when we arrived at the collection space, it was dusty, it was dark, and there were stacks of boxes of things and uh, objects scattered about. Just didn't seem like there was any organization or any real value or respect placed on uh, uh, you know, the items that they, were, that they had in their possession. Uh, and there were items that we wanted to see, and we were basically told that, well, we can't get to those items because they're in another room, and they're, you know. So we did see a few things. And the things that we did see uh, brought tears to the eyes of our cultural leaders. And these were things that I should not have seen, for, um, because I am not of the societies that are associated with these materials. And, and so the shock was just even, uh, even more elevated. And I didn't understand how a federal institution like the Smithsonian um, was so careless and um, not very interested in helping um, our particular tribe. And I thought about all of the other native people who might be uh, experiencing the same thing. Later on, we visited 
uh, the Field Museum in Chicago. And there, uh, you know, it, it was a similar experience. But we were, I think, most taken aback by the, the exhibit. And there's a historic photograph of the original exhibit that was at the Field Museum, the photograph on your left, um, that uh, uh, was only you know, deinstalled uh, just a few years ago. And the Southwest section was very troublesome because we also saw items of cultural significance that were on display items that have been nailed to two by fours and um, on display for, for many, many years. And then I started to also think about the archeology span that was, uh, and the excavations that um, really created these collections of um, uh, archeological materials, the artifacts, the, the ancestors and their associated funer funerary materials that were removed from places like Washbashaka and um, um, Kashkacht and other places. And so I also took this kind of deep dive on my own to understand the science um, and the history associated with some of the more significant excavations that um, unearthed many of our ancestors and many artifacts that were now housed at the Smithsonian and at the Field Museum. So this shock um, seemed to just continue to um, live within my, me and I, it, it just really uh, sparked an interest. And so when I completed my term as the Lieutenant Governor, I, I did return back to the uh, to the university, only this time at the University of New Mexico and studied anthropology. Um, but there are many wrongs um, and it is unfortunate that we are now at a time that we have the great responsibility as native people to correct those wrongs, um, to bring them to the forefront and and really engage in, in ways that we would have never expected um, to ensure that there's some level of accountability, that there is um, uh, institutions um, are adhering to the federal laws uh, that exist today, um, and that we do all that we can with the, our limited resources to repatriate and return our ancestors back to the earth. As Juan indicated, you know, I'm involved in a, a significant repatriation at the Wiseman Museum. Um, and this is only one of many that I have been involved and there are, th this work will continue for I don't know how long. Um, but I, I remain engaged in this work um, uh, because I feel it's you know, part of my responsibility. Uh, as an Akama person and a cultural leader. Um, and uh, I'm so grateful to join many other Pueblo people and Native people who are also involved in this work and really you know, um, uh, may have made the commitment to ensure that we um, realize some change in the ways in which institutions um, are, are um, handling our ancestors and collections of, of art and material culture, um, and, and the ways in which institutions are telling the story. Um, and so th this work, um, I, I, I really feel, and I didn't include a, a photo of the School for Advanced Research in Santa Fe, uh, but during my term as the director of the Indian Arts Research Center, um, really opened the door for, for me to advance this work um, and, and really to follow in the steps of uh, 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 Dr. Cynthia Chavez Lamar of San Felipe Pueblo, who is now the director of the National Museum of the American Indian, um, who really set the tone for 
this particular institution and how it would engage in um, bringing some really critical issues to the forefront. And, um, and so Dr. Chavez Lamar and others, um, uh, and, and including myself, were uh, engaged in the development of um, a number of symposiums and um, other gatherings, informal gatherings, to discuss how we might begin to influence some change and uh, better understand um, the ways that we might have some influence um, on, on the non-native uh, community. Uh, so we, um, during my tenure at uh, the uh, School for Advanced Research, uh, we did publish a set of guidelines, um, guidelines for collaboration, which are a really a simple set of, of guidelines that inform museums and communities about how they can work together uh, to address all um, the issues that are of most importance to the respective communities. Um, and so it's everything from repatriation, it's everything from curatorial work, uh, collection stewardship, uh, conservation, uh, and other issues that are um, significant to, to Pueblo people and Native people. Later on, um, the, uh, the development of these guidelines um, created additional interest from the museum community uh, as well as uh, Native scholars, Native artists, um, and, and uh, tribal leaders um, to, to begin to develop uh, a series of standards for uh, museums who um, have collections of Native American um, materials. Um, so the standards for museums with Native American collections emerged uh, as did the Indigenous Collections Care Guide. Uh, and both of these resources were developed in partnership with the American Alliance for Museums, uh, uh, among other uh, national and international um, uh, organizations who uh, deal with similar um, work. So these um, uh, particular resources have become kind of the uh, um, become foundational in uh, the work that our native people are, are engaged where uh, um, museums are concerned. Uh, but it's also refreshing and, and I'm very grateful to, to see how the Native American artists are um, also engaged. Um, the, the development of um, Native American, contemporary Native arts is just so exciting. And um, I really feel like, and I'm grateful for that the, this movement has even um, um, had greater success than the um, kind of more procedural or the process that we've, uh, some of us have been engaged in terms of developing resources that inform museums about how to do the work. Um, but Native arts, the Native artists have also taken a, um, made a commitment, but are also taking great risks um, to uh, introduce issues uh, similar issues to the museum field um, and to the collector communi collecting community, um, to the academy. And, and this is really um, uh, you know, a time in our, our lives that I think is um, so incredibly, um, I mean, it just, I, I think there's just some promise here. There's some hope that, and, and uh, it is really influencing the work that some of us are doing around repatriation. So I am grateful to uh, this particular institution for inviting um, and engaging our Native American artists in the development of this installation uh, because it, it is, um, I think, 
the preferred way to, to, to do this work, um, to bring some very critical issues to the forefront that are important to Native people. Um, and it is really, really setting the tone for some meaningful change in the way uh, in which museums do their work. <clears throat> so um, in 2018, uh, at the end of 2018, I was called back to my Pueblo, um, this time appointed as governor. Um, and I would you know, serve three years as governor. And um, when I left the School for Advanced Research to, um, to, to be governor, um, uh, you know, we had been in dialogue with a number of institutions, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, I had just um, completed a term as an advisor, cultural advisor to the Met on the installation of the Diker Collection and the exhibit, Native, uh, The Art of Native America. Um, and we learned a lot about the Met. I mean, it's such a monster of an institution um, and it, it really just opened our eyes to the complexities of these flagship institutions. Um, and at the same time we were doing this work with the Met, um, some of us fr from throughout Indian country had also been asked to join an advisory committee at the Field Museum for the rehabilitation of um, that uh, Northwest, or not the Northwest, but the American uh, Hall uh, American Indian Hall, and um, uh, it was termed a rehabilitation, but at, at, at some point in that process, we uh, convinced the museum that it just needed to be deinstalled, and an entirely new exhibition um, had to be uh, developed and installed in that space. But we were learning about, um, you know, the process of these institutions, the kind of these foundational pieces of these institutions that very colonial, of course, um, but that there were some opportunities to be engaged and there were opportunities to perhaps influence some of their decision making. At the Met, with the opening of Art of Native America, there was a great deal of controversy. And those of us who participated in that uh, initiative recognized early on that we would confront, be confronted with, with those um, issues because there just was not enough time taken by the institution to understand the, the gift, the promised gift of the Dikers. Um, they did not know what they were accepting. And you know, these relationships between donors and museums is also another monster. <laughs> um, and we learned very quickly that um, the donors um, and the museum had agreements in place. And so there was little room to even shift the thinking um, to change the object listing. Um, but we came in at a time where we had some influence in how um, uh, the narrative of this particular exhibit. Not for everything, but for some things. It also gave us the opportunity to ask some questions of the Met, to ask them about repatriation, to ask them about collection stewardship, and to understand really the um, the Native American collections that were in the possession of this particular institution. For Pueblo country and Pueblo people, there were many sensitive items and there are uh, uh, sensitive items that are held by the Met. But for the first time in a very long time, even while the Met said they were NAGPRA compliant, we had to remind them and, and or inform them that they were not. So the discussion around repatriation um, was uh, advanced and uh, I'm happy to say that um, through the actions of the, the, the highest leadership at the Met, there is a commitment to begin um, work around uh, repatriation and consultation with tribes. 
while also um, uh, providing a space for our Native American contemporary Native American artists um, to engage with this institution. One of the things that uh, at the end of 2018 that I was excited about was that we had um, proposed an idea to the Met about, um, when I say we, it was not only the School for Advanced Research, but also a partner at the time, a new partner, um, the Vilcek Foundation, uh, also based in New York City, uh, about this idea um, that we could bring the collection of the Indian Arts Research Center, the Pueblo Pottery Collection of, of the Indian Arts Research Center uh, to the Met. And um, uh, just before the close of that year, we were informed by the Met that they would be willing to host such an exhibit. So when I left, my successor, Alicia Poon, um, I'm so grateful to her and her team for uh, working with the Vilcek Foundation to ensure that this did become a reality. And um, just this uh, summer, um, Grounded in Clay, um, uh, the Spirit of Pueblo Pottery, which is a traveling exhibition, did arrive in New York City and is featured not only at the Met, but also at the Vilcek Foundation Gallery. So you have this spectrum of, of work that happened over a very short period of time and during the time of, this, of, the, of a global pandemic. Um, that created a oppor great opportunity for, um, for Native people. And I'm so excited that an institution like the Met, even while it has its, its problems, <laughs> uh, and we, that we have not even you know, um, uh, initiated, I shouldn't say we, but th they have not initiated um, the consultation process around NAGPRA that there's still so much that needs to be done within the institution to um, generate the support that it needs to do the work. But good news is that there is movement and so far um, the relationships that have been built, um, the trust that is being built is, is certainly a good sign for uh, more change and more movement. I mentioned the Field Museum and the Native Truths exhibit, and you know this was also a project that some of us were engaged for uh, almost six years. And the outcome was uh, what's now Native Truths, our voices, our stories, um, where a number of Native people from throughout the country um, came together to create this um, and curate this exhibition. Now, the, the, this was the main goal uh, initially, was to uh, rehabilitate that hall and introduce a new exhibition. But when we insisted upon, we, the advisors insisted upon meeting with the leadership of the institution, we had a laundry list of other items that we felt were uh, very, uh, or equally important. Uh, maybe some that were even of greater significance to, to our native people, and one being the repatriation. The field has a history, um, and it's, it's, it isn't a good one. Uh, they, they don't have the greatest reputation um, for successfully you know, re uh, initiating repatriation. And there's still a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done there. But what I will say is that they have made a commitment at the highest level of the institution's uh, leadership to provide the resources so that these discussions can continue and that these processes can be developed so that the institution can be more engaged in uh, fulfilling their uh, responsibilities and the mandates of NAGPRA. There are also many issues around collections st uh, stewardship, conservation being one of the uh, probably most paramount because of everything that was deinstalled from the original exhibit, everything damaged on some level, um, and, you know, it's, it's, uh, it will take a tremendous amount of resources and time to achieve um, the, some of the, the priorities associated with conservation. There is also the issue of access. This is one of those institutions um, that has a history of, uh, you know, not really providing any access. 
um, two collections. Um, um, and you know, Native people have been very frustrated uh, about this, and uh, we are uh, working with the, um, the museum at this time to provide uh, greater access for our Native people to come in and visit collections. There are also um, significant issues around the long-term uh, storage and care of um, uh, the ancestors and their associated funerary materials. Uh, this is another priority of, um, associated with this project. Uh, we have insisted that <laughs> and, have, and remain hopeful that there will be more Native people hired um, to help uh, uh, in this work. Um, and there have been some um, uh, Native people uh, who have been hired in, in the conservation department. Um, but we have yet to see um, a Native American curator um, of, of the North American collections. Um, uh, we do, uh, I just learned a couple of weeks ago that a, a Native American liaison position has been created and that um, that position will be available um, and someone hired, uh, we hope, in the, uh, before the summer of next year. So it's, you know, so many things and baby steps, really. Um, and it's, it's so uh, exhausting. <laughs> uh, you know, sometimes we feel like we're not heard, uh, those of us who serve as advisors. Um, but then, you know, we, we will get a call. We will receive an email. Or we will hear of an engagement with communities and the museum, or the museum's engagement with a Native artist. Um, and that gives us some hope. Um, so you know, I, I have to uh, say that while the, the storyline here doesn't seem so um, happy um, and positive, that even those small um, uh, positive outcomes, they, they have great impact. And, and we are you know, harnessing those, um, uh, those small wins so that we might realize even uh, uh, more significant change as we move forward. <laughs> so I'm going to share a couple of slides here of um, you know, some of the um, uh, labels that you see within Native Truths. and. You know, it's just a wide range of Native people who are featured, their, their voices featured, and their artwork featured. Um, and it's, if, if those of you who have vis ever visited the um, uh, former exhibition uh, will remember, you know, that narrative was, I mean, it was so old, and it, it wasn't relevant. Um, it didn't take into consideration, really, the, um, the, the voice of our Native people. It was very anthropological and um, very white-centered, um, uh, and just very problematic. But um, we now have, um, you know, have had the opportunity to engage our own Native people in this uh, development of this exhibition, and it's been quite successful. Also in Chicago is the Art Institute, and you know, this this is one of. A, a, you know, I, I will just say that our, our work here uh, will continue. Uh, there are some significant issues associated with collections of uh, ancestral Pueblo materials that are considered sacred, that are considered burial items. Um, but we're working with them to uh, really shape a program for uh, more access, some consultation, and, and certainly for promoting Native American contemporary art. Um, and thankfully, there are many others who are involved and engaged in this work. Um, uh, it's, it's an institution that is willing to, uh, to learn and engage, and uh, it's, it's been a long time coming, I, I will say that. Um, and it's, um, uh, its leadership is also uh, has made a commitment to ensure that um, these initiatives are, are uh, advanced. <clears throat> the Dion Museum in San Francisco is another um, um,
project that I've uh, been involved in, uh, along with a number of Native American uh, advisors. Um, and this is one of those situations, again, where the museum was uh, kind of up in arms about uh, what to do with a situation that was really created by um, an individual who gifted a significant collection of Pueblo materials to the museum. And so the collections review, and the initial collections review informed um, us, all of us who, who were involved, that a large majority of this collection was considered sensitive, culturally sensitive. When we uh, finally had the opportunity to meet with the donor, um, it was very clear that he was not so interested in hearing our um, uh, observations and opinions about what was being proposed in terms of an exhibition and providing this collection uh, to the public for research uh, and other, other uses. It took some time for us to convince him and to help him understand um, why we were saying that it needed to be a collection that was restricted until such time um, that consultation occurred with the, uh, the, the affiliated Pueblo communities um, and then it just advanced uh, to include the larger com collection of Native American items at the, this museum. So an exhibition uh, did not um, uh, emerge as a result of this. But what did happen was, uh, and what the donor did agree to, was to create a catalog. A catalog of this collection that um, would present the collection to the public, but also bring together Native people themselves to um, tell the story about the items. Um, and it also uh, then generated interest by um, some artists, some Native artists who uh, become involved, uh, namely artists from the um, uh, Northwest Coast and also uh, tribes from Northern California. But it also, because of the, the, this collection was so, um, um, you know, a majority of the collection was Southwest, uh, it also provided an opportunity to test the waters uh, on a collaborative exhibition um, project. And um, Bobby Sil Silas, who is Hopi and Zuni, um, curated a, a small show featuring Hopi pottery in uh, one of the smaller galleries. And it just really was a great exercise for the museum and for the, the uh, donor himself to observe and see um, what an exhibit could look like and be like and feel like um, when, when you engage um, the, the, the people from where these collections um, or originate. <clears throat> we also had the opportunity to help the Dion um, begin to look at a more formal program for collaboration with Native people where other exhibitions were concerned. And so the Ansel Adams exhibit is one of those uh, where uh, some Pueblo representatives had the opportunity to pro uh, write uh, labels uh, for some of the imagery that featured um, uh, their homelands. So this is the catalog. It's it's a major doorstop. <laughs> you know, it's it's I don't remember how many pounds it is, but it's a massive catalog. And one of the outcomes was you know the Mimbri's pottery that are part of this collection. Many of them are burial items. Um, others are ceremonial items, as identified by Pueblo experts. Um, and those Pueblo experts were able to uh, determine what imagery on some of these items uh, could be reproduced. And so uh, the, they decided to uh, uh, commission a Pueblo artist, graphic artist, to recreate some of the imagery on these plates um, uh, that are part of the catalog. 
Now in the catalog, you will also see the same kind of plate structure of these squares that are just a series of dots. There is no imagery. And those indicate that um, uh, those pieces are burial items and or significant cultural items that are not for um, public access. The next step in this project is to curate an exhibition. And so we've brought together a team of Native American uh, museum professionals uh, and artists uh, to begin planning um, for uh, planning the exhibition. Uh, we're hopeful that as the development um, uh, continues that there will be other opportunities for our Native artists and other Native uh, uh, representatives, our Native scholars, uh, to be directly involved in um, the curation of this exhibit. Our tribal museums are also um, having a profound impact on um, the ways in which museums um, operate. They are setting the bar. They are, they are um, really being, uh, bringing forth innovative um, programs and exhibitions uh, that are really shifting also the, the, the change and this, you know, the, this creating this paradigm shift within museums and even among our tribal museums because a lot of our older tribal museums uh, were built and founded on the same principles that um, uh, non-native museums are. And, and so when you have an, uh, uh, a tribal museum like the First Americans Museum in Oklahoma City um, and others um, who are you know, setting these new standards uh, it's really refreshing and really, you know, provides uh, uh, more resources for other tribes who are looking to build their own tribal museums, uh, who are uh, maybe have an interest in formalizing historic preservation offices so that they can do more work around repatriation and um, uh, cultural preservation. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, when I visited at FAM at close, shortly after they opened, um, I was just so taken aback by uh, the depth of the information that is presented about all of the tribes in Oklahoma City um, and all of this information coming directly from uh, tribal community members. Another area that we're seeing some change and shift is within our federal system itself with our national parks um, and our federal institutions and federal agencies who also um, uh, hold collections of ancestors and associated funerary materials and art. Um, but also, you know, in our national parks where we uh, are seeing for the first time um, a revised uh, visitor's experience that is now based on information provided by the descendant communities themselves. Uh, this is a photo of uh, Mesa Verde and, and uh, the dancers there at one of the sites um, who participated in a uh, film production uh, which uh, uh, just replaced a, a f interpretive film that was running for close to 30 years. But the new film um, is really beautiful and really captures you know, contemporary, um, the, 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 the um, contemporary Pueblo communities, the descendant communities that exist today, uh, but while also telling the story of this connection to the place uh, and to the ancestors. I mentioned the Vilcek Foundation earlier, and this is a photo of the Grounded in Clay exhibition at their gallery. And um, this is also another um, uh, change that we're seeing is the, the private collector or the uh, non-native foundations who are reaching out and asking about how they can be engaged in this work. The Vilcek Foundation has made a, a commitment to advance native art. Um, and they are in the process of developing a uh, more robust uh, program, cultural program, that uh, really focuses on contemporary Native arts while also um, doing or providing resources to assist tribes with the preservation of culture 
and language um, and traditional arts. So uh, really happy to see that this is evolving um, and we're hopeful that more um, private foundations will step forward to join this movement. Santa Fe, as some of you may, may know, is you know, uh, one of the uh, country's um, largest art scenes, many galleries, um, and it's always so refreshing to see when um, uh, our institutions in New Mexico, are, where are, they have access to so many Native people, uh, are also uh, reaching out even beyond the tribes that are located in our state. This is a Daniel Gibson show that I thought was just really incredible. Some of the work that's also stemming from all of this is you know, the impact on policy, on federal policy. Um, just last year, President Biden signed into law the Safeguard, Objects of Tribal, Safeguard Tribal Objects of Patrimony, or the STOP Act. Um, I, I was, I've been engaged in this initiative since its very inception, and what this uh, law, uh, new law, is designed to do is to really address the ongoing problem of uh, illegal trafficking of uh, cultural patrimony. Uh, we are now in the stage of developing the process for implementation of this new law, uh, but it's something that is um, also going to impact our ability to repatriate internationally. Um, because currently the federal system or the federal laws that exist just do not provide um, the, the resources and or process for the federal government to assist tribes in the work um, that we're hoping to be more engaged um, uh, where international repatriation is concerned. And this final um, slide is just, you know, this is my paternal grandmother and my father is uh, the taller kid <laughs> standing next to her whose birthday it is today. He just turned 81 today, my dad. So happy birthday, dad. <laughs> um, and the photo on the, on the right is of my niece, my only niece, um, Gabby. And she's holding the canes of the governor. Uh, this was during my term as governor. And because she's the only, um, she's considered my mother. In, in my culture, and so she's my caretaker, and um, anytime um, you know a, a male is appointed to serve as a tribal official, um, the women, uh, your your mothers, uh, are the caretakers of these canes. Um, the original cane, which was given by Spain, um, these are all symbols of uh, our sovereignty and our authority. Uh, the Abraham Lincoln cane, which was presented to our Pueblos in 1863, and um, the Mexican cane are all tied together. And, and so anytime I would return home at the old Pueblo on the Mesa top, she would always be there to welcome the canes home. So she would always take great care and spend time with them, just holding them this way and talking to them and asking them to, to help me fulfill my role. Um, and it's, as I tell my family uh, and my, remind my community that, you know, we all need to be engaged in this work. Um, we all have to ask ourselves the hard questions about what are we doing as Native people to fulfill our inherent responsibility to care for and protect and nurture and ensure that our cultures and our uh, way of life and our language continues. And so I have and put great faith in my little niece there. Who, she's, my, she's the only one in our family. Um, my other siblings do not have daughters. It's all boys. Uh, but she has the great responsibility of caring for the family and ensuring that her children and her grandchildren and great-grandchildren will do the same. So I, I do what I can in this time to ensure that her job isn't so heavy. So I want to say thank you for this time and uh, opportunity to share a little bit with you today. Uh, I, too, am an artist. This is one of my pieces. Um, 
and I'm also a potter, but like Juan, I make pottery only when I have to. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's usually uh, for ceremony. So thank you again. We'll take just a, a quick break to get the next panel set up, and then we'll start with our um, artist panel uh, on representation in just a few minutes. But thank you again so much, Brian, for being here. And yeah, um, so stay tuned, just a few minutes. Thank you. <laughs> 